Butler, and he said, hey, now Frank Butler was a sharpshooter. He would be a good addition to the show. And Frank said, hey, I've got an act that I want you to see, Bill. And I said, well, I wouldn't mind seeing it. I've got a tent up. Come by tomorrow at noontime and show us what's going on. So he came, and he had an armful of gun cases. And he had a bag full of, of gold and, and, and red and blue glass balls. And, and we had a table set up for him. And, and he started putting things out. He started laying guns out, 22s and shotguns and, and lever action, 30-30s. And as he laid them out, he said, I'll be right back. And he came back with a little girl dressed in, in what appeared to be school clothes. She was not even five foot tall. And I assumed that perhaps he had had a daughter that I hadn't heard about. And I sat there waiting for him to either do the show himself or to bring on a marksman, because obviously it was a, a marksmanship show. And he said, I'd like to introduce to you my wife. And I waited for his wife to come into the tent. And he said, no, this is my wife here. She was not even five foot tall. And I laughed. And he said, Bill, just watch. I sat back, I shook my head, and I whispered to my business manager that this was a show that was never going to be in the Wild West. And a young lady from over in Preble County, was it Preble County? No, no. Dark, it was Dark County. Dark, yes, Dark, that's where she was from. A young lady from Dark County, from Greenville, Ohio, stepped up in the schoolgirl clothes, and Frank Butler started throwing those glass balls up, and she picked up a 22, and one after another, bang, 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 bang. Any place he threw, and no matter how high he threw, she blew those things away, and I sat there with my mouth open, ready to eat my words. He started picking up cards and throwing cards in the air and then coins and she would shoot coins and, and the silver dime she shot through with the 22 and he brought it to me and he handed it to me and I didn't say a word. <laughs> and then he stood up close and he said, you need to watch this, Bill. And he held up a card, a playing card. And instead of holding it flat like this, he turned it like this and held it out. And Annie Oakley shot it in half. We went on tour later on. For 17 years, she was with us. We went on tour later on, and, and Frank did the guns, and he shot some, but it was always about Annie. It was always about Annie. When, when we were in Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm saw the show, and he wanted to stand there, and he wanted to hold the card up and I refused to allow him. Later on, when war broke out, Annie herself wrote a letter to Kaiser Wilhelm and said if he was interested, she would allow him to hold the card and she would shoot through it, perhaps. <laughs> now, I don't know in the Baptist church if I should tell you this story, but I will, I will tell you anyway. And you'll have to pardon me, Roger, because this is a story about Frank Butler. We were in town and we were having what you might call liquid refreshments, if you understand what I'm saying. We had big steaks and Frank had left Annie in her tent and he had come in and we were having steaks and we needed something, of course, to wash it down uh, of an adult beverage nature. And as, as we're washing it down, we had, had several drinks, but Frank had one. And he got up to go out and he swung the doors open as he went out the door of the saloon, I mean the, the, the establishment where we were eating. He looked to his left and he looked to his right and his horse was missing. And he turned around and he put his hands on his hips and he came back in. Everybody in there knew that his wife was Annie Oakley. Everybody in there knew she was called Little Sure Shot, but everybody also knew that Frank Butler was not a bad shot himself and could probably outshoot everybody inside. And he said, I'm going to tell you this. I don't know which one of you scoundrels, you sidewinders, you no good, dirty, low stinking skunks took my horse. But I'm coming back in here and I'm going to sit down with Bill and I'm going to have me another drink. 
And when I'm done, I'm going out there. And if my horse isn't out there, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. The same thing's going to happen that happened in Texas. I'll tell you what, eyebrows went up. <laughs> he came over and he ordered something to drink and he sat down and he sipped on it real slow. And when he was done, he stood up and he brushed himself off, pulled his britches up, just kind of tapped his sidearms to make sure they were there. And he walked out, and sure enough, there was his horse tied up where it had been. And I was out there right beside him because I didn't want to see trouble. And I said, Frank, let me tell you, I'm glad the horse is back. He said, me too. I said, well, let me ask you, you said you would have done what you did in Texas if the horse was gone. What would you have done? He said, well, Bill, if the horse hadn't been there, I'd have done exactly what I did in Texas. I'd have walked back to the camp. <laughs> As you heard, Wild Bill Hickok, who was a scoundrel, was in the show for a year. But you know, we had another great man in the show. He was a short guy. He was battle scarred. He was crippled because his horse had fallen on him. When he came to be with the show for one year, for one year only, I trained a special horse that was gray for him to ride. His name, well, I don't remember his Indian name, his Sioux name, but we called him Sitting Bull. Even though he was a short man, you knew that he was a leader of men because when he would walk in, he was an amazing man. Now, when they went to him, I had to get permission to be a, a registered Indian agent in order for him and some of his, his braves to come. And by the way, when you talk about Indian wives, you do not call them squaws. Because squaw is a term for women that, that have bad reputations. They're wives. And they had multiple wives. You need to remember they were not Christians. When we went and I sent my business manager to talk with him about coming and, and riding with us for a while, he negotiated his own contract and we agreed to pay him $100 a month. We agreed to pay three of his wives $25 a month and seven of his braves $50 a month just to come and ride with us. And they would set their, their teepees up outside the show. And he had also discussed with us that he would sell his own photographs and his own autographs. He carried around change and when kids would come up to him, he would give them pennies and give them nickels. And he loved candy and he always had candy. When he met Annie Oakley, he named her, in his language, Little Sure Shot. And he made her his daughter. In a grand ceremony, he adopted her into the Sioux Nation. Now, several years later, he took with him the horse that we had trained in. And when he would come in, the first time he came into the, in, into the arena, he came in and I would announce to the whole community that was there, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you here in this place, Buffalo Bill is proud to introduce our former enemy, my current and always friend, the American Sitting Bull. And Sitting Bull with all his finery would come riding out on that gray horse and people would begin shooting all around him. His braves would come out on horses and running out and they would shoot. And when the shooting started, the horse would raise up on its hind feet and it would paw at the sky. And Sitting Bull would raise one hand and then he wouldn't shoot. He rode around the arena and then out. People flocked to him. Several years later, he took his horse with him after one year when he had to go home. The United States government would not let him and his, his braves travel with us any longer. We had Pawnees that continued to travel, but the Sioux were not allowed. Several years later, there was an Indian prophet that said that if they would make shirts that were ghost shirts and they would do what they called the ghost dance and sing the ghost song, if they did it often enough, white men's bullets would not harm them 
and the buffalo would return because by this time the buffalo were almost gone. And that traveled through all the nations, all the tribes. And there were braves that had been hired to be watchmen, had been hired to be security guards. And the United States government declared that the guns that they hunted with would be taken away from them. And soldiers were sent. And the security guards that were Indians came in to they came into the camp and Sitting Bull came out. But I'm going to pause there and tell you what I did when I heard that the army was going to arrest some of the warriors and they were going to take their guns. I loaded up a buckboard full of treats, candies and, and cookies and, and food and, and things that I knew that, that Sitting Bull would love and I went trying to get to the reservation and I got halfway there and the army turned me away the same day that Sitting Bull died. <laughs> he saw that they were there and they were taking away guns and he came out and he started to do what they thought was the ghost dance. He had his ghost shirt on and they shot him and killed him dead. When they did, the interesting thing is when they shot him and the shooting started, his gray horse thought that he was back in the show. And when he heard shooting, what did that gray horse, what was he trained to do? He reared up on his hind legs and he began pawing at the sky. And the Indians that were there, the suit that were there watching, thought that the ghost of Sitting Bull had gone into that horse and they would not touch it, they would not feed it. And I had to go and take the horse and bring him back. Now there was an old gal that was with us named Calamity Jane. And I gotta tell you, Calamity Jane was always in love with Wild Bill Hickok. He claimed he didn't have nothing to do with her, but when he died, when he was shot with the dead man's hand in his hands. Now, what is the dead man's hand? What, what cards, of course, Baptists don't play cards, of course. <laughs> but what cards would have been in his hands that they call the dead man's hand? Aces and eights. Aces and eights. And he was shot holding those. And from that time on, they call it the dead man's hand. But before, before you, you worry about him dying, let me tell you and worry about this. When he died, and when she died, he was buried right next to Calamity Jane. Now, I got a story to tell you about Calamity. She did not dress well. She wore men's clothes, and they were not often clean. And I hired her to be a story to, to, storyteller to tell the stories of the West. And she would tell about when she was a mule skinner. She would tell about when she was a miner. She had funny stories. But I had a boy that came, and he, he just snuck away from his parents, and, and he asked to stay with us, and we allowed him to. And, and I said, but you've got to ride with Calamity. And she was toward the back of the, uh, of the wagon train as we were trying to get to the railroad cars. And she had an old mule. It was an old, old Omri, white and yellow-looking thing. And, it stopped when it was hungry. It stopped when it was thirsty. And, and she had a way of taking care of it. This mule was going and, and it was going slower and slower. And we were getting further and further away. She was back in the back of the line. And, and she said, get up. And it wouldn't get up. And it stopped at an old cactus and started eating on the cactus. She said, get up. And it wouldn't get up. And she said, just a minute, son, to the boy that was riding with her. And she got a hammer handle out. And she went over around that mule and lifted its chin up from that cactus and looked it in the eye and said, oh, mule, that's one. Wham! Hit it right in the middle of the eyes. Got back in and said, get up, mule. And the mule took off and went for about three miles till they got to another cactus and it was still hungry. And it stopped and it started eating again. And she said, hold on, boy, just a minute. And she laid the reins down because the mule wouldn't move. And she picked up that hammer handle again and she went out and looked at the mule, picked its head up and said, hey, mule, that's two and wham! Hit it right between the eyes. And the boy said, man, that's mean. She said, yeah, but it works. Watch this. Get up. And the mule got up until they went about five miles. And it stopped right in the middle of the stream. And it was drinking. And it drank. And it drank. And it drank. And no matter what calamity Jen, Jane did, it just did not move. She said, get up, mule. And it wouldn't get up. And she said, oh. And the boy handed her the hammer handle. And she said, don't need that. And he thought, well, that's good. 
She got out and she went around and she looked at the mule. She lifted his head up and she said, Mule lives free. And she took a gun out of her pocket and shot it dead. <laughs> and when she got back on the wagon and started unhitching everything, the boy next to her that we said could ride with her said, Calamity, that's an awful mean thing to do. She said, Boy, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> We had a fella named Cookie, and he was our cook, and he had a little old scroungy little old dog about yay big that he called Little Cookie. And Little Cookie went everywhere.